This is Coda Radio, recorded on August 19th, 2024. Hey friend, welcome in to Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly talk show, taking a pragmatic look at the art and the business of software development and the world of technology. My name is Chris, and recovering from his visit with President Roswell, it's our host, Mr. Dominic. Hello, Mike. I got tossed right out the airlock. <laughs> you know, you kind of came in hot. I saw the video. It was all over oh, Twitter. Oh, you know. Well. <laughs> Speaking of coming in hot, you know, everybody has been jumping in on the AI hype. But I think maybe we're starting to see the beginning of the trend reversal. I don't know if the name James Cuda rings a bell. He's not the inventor of Cuda, as far as I know. But he is the CEO of Procreate, which is a very popular design app on the iPad. And he posted a video about how Procreate is not implementing AI features. And everybody's been asking, when when AI features, when AI features. It's pretty spicy, so I wanted to play a moment of it for you. Are we rolling? You've been asking us about AI. You know, I usually don't like getting in front of the camera. I prefer that our products speak for themselves. I really f***ing hate Journey of AI. I don't like what's happening in the industry, and I don't like what it's doing to artists. We're not going to be introducing any generative AI into our products. Our products are always designed and developed with the idea that a human will be creating something. You know, we don't exactly know where this story is going to go or how it ends, but we believe that we're on the right path supporting human creativity. Oh, now how about that? Is that spicy or what? Yeah, that's uh, my, my, my. I don't get, I don't get um, the hostility quite because you can have both, right? Like you can have something that would, it would be great to have something that is an advanced tool that generates pictures to my spef- specifications. And then if I as a human want to use it, that seems fine. But as a human, I don't have to use it either. But there's definitely some hostility in there, including f bombs about it. Yeah, I, I don't I know think, how I feel about that. I, see, when I zoom out, I think the fact that a company can say that and they're getting notoriety for saying that is an indication that there has been a sentiment shift. I yeah, I mean, I, I think I think the the hot air got a little too hot too fast. But you know, it, it, so honestly, when you played that clip, the first thing that popped into my mind was uh, Master Yoda. Mm, fear leads to anger. Mm. So, with that said, Procreate competes with Adobe, who are just the worst. I'm sorry, but you guys are like dicks of the first order. Oh, that's good. That's good context. You're with this framing. It's like they're taking the anti-Adobe position because Adobe's all in. I, I I don't know when Adobe became super evil, but I think Flash, Flash. Yeah, I guess so. I just, it's really the creative cloud stuff really just chapped my ass a little too much. I, I can't, I, I don't know. I, I, I like reflexively support any competitor of theirs. I don't, I don't do a ton of design stuff. I contract most of that out now. So, I mean, but we still, TMB still has a creative cloud license because you, you have to, right? Someone's going to send you a Photoshop or an Illustrator file. And that's just the way, like, it doesn't feel like a product choice. It feels like a tax almost. Now you're spitting some wisdom here when you're saying that fear leads to anger. That's got to be what it is. Um, but still, it's it's an interesting shift in the tone. I don't know. I, I You know, I just look back and I think what a couple of, what a wild year and a half it was around AI. And when it first kicked off, you could say no wrong. And we're still kind of in that era. I think another sign of when things will really have turned is when everyone finally starts talking about how horribly creepy WorldCoin is and the fact that Sam Altman is tied to this horrible, creepy cryptocurrency that wants to track your eyeball scan on a blockchain. And it'll give you $25 of their fake WorldCoin to to do it or whatever. Like, it's the creepiest thing. And it's, it's, the, it's the quintessential definition of tech bro thinks he's invented something to solve problems for a country he's hardly ever been to. And is also creating the very problem that creates the need. And that's not getting talked about. Like, so we're clearly not fully in the we can talk about everything phase yet. But Mr. Kuda coming out here feels like a a, a sea shift. And then you combine that with the activity that's happening on Wall Street. I don't know if anybody cares, but 
you're seeing the rotation from the Magnificent Seven that we witnessed for the last year or so. You're seeing them rotate into what's called smaller caps, which means smaller market cap companies. And they're smaller tech companies that have much, much, much more regular everyday missions and and valuations and not these, you know, crazy long shot AI NVIDIA plays. So the stock market is is moving where it's putting its money too. And it's AI still getting money, of course, but it's not the only thing getting money now. And then you see CUDA coming out here saying, you know, F off AI. There's a I, I think the bubble is perhaps we're we're finally getting to that phase where we're going to slowly settle down on the actual things that are left and practical that get implemented and put into production. You know, I, I go back to just as an example, a few years ago, the edge and IOT was all the talk. It's just a few years ago I was down at Dell during the peak of this. And most of what Dell showed me wasn't their Linux systems. It was all of their IoT stuff and this new edge management platform that they were going to work with the Linux Foundation to open source because IoT and the edge are the next frontier of technology. And it was all they all the tech industry talked about for years. Well, like three years. Until it just became normal and standardized and internalized and the hype faded and we sort of settled on a practical implementation of these things and a practical use case where we put things on the edge versus centralized. But that was a huge conversation for a while and now we don't talk about edge devices and IoT at all. Yeah, I mean, we've been talking about this for years now, right? That ever since the mobile app boom, I feel like the industry has been looking for the next, you know, big hotness that would generate uh, outsized returns. You know what I've realized, Mike? It's because the tech industry has sort of been what's holding up the S&P 500 and everybody's 401ks and everybody's investment in, in in the stock market has really been, I mean, there's other companies like defense and there's been healthcare. But when you zoom out since the dot com boom, tech has been an exponential performer. Today, as we record, Google IPO'd 20 years ago. Their stock is up 7,200% since the day they IPO'd, 7,200%. Tech has been a significant market grower, one of the few sources of growth in the United States for the last 20 years. And so I think the reason why they've got addicted to chasing bubble after bubble is because the entire financial system in the country is hooked on tech. And they refer to tech as a risk on kind of investment. So they consider tech stocks to be volatile and somewhat risky, but that's the kind of stuff that the market likes to play to get returns is the volatile stuff. And so they look at tech as this volatile play to get good big gains and their big bets on Wall Street, and they got hooked on it. And so now tech is expected to continually deliver on that, so they're jumping faster and harder into every next thing that comes along because everything's riding on it. Yeah, no, I I, I absolutely believe that i mean but yeah, i don't know what to say it seems pretty obvious to me i mean have you been grocery shopping recently oh my gosh yeah like i wish i owned a, a a chicken coop honestly if i could just for a moment mention you know inflation is still up it is going up at a slower pace right now well, so we- but, but but it's up on the basics yeah, right. it's, it's stuff you really you, – you're a forced buyer in a lot of ways. It's, so right now we're kind of – everybody's celebrating because like I think the CPI went to 3 or 2.9. It's in that range. It's you know a matter of kind of probably margin of error now. But that means it's still, it's still gaining. So think of it like this. Three years ago, you put on 36 pounds in one year. That was really bad. And then the next year, you put on 12 pounds. And now this year, you've put on six pounds. You're still way overweight. You're just putting on weight slower. That's what we're celebrating right now. Inflation is still above the Fed's 2% target by about a full percent. And I would argue 2% inflation is still ridiculous theft. So it's not solved. It's still extremely expensive to operate a family or a business Unless you're in our audience's demographic for a lot of them who are in very well-to-do tech jobs, that's the class that has been impacted, I think, the least by all of this in the last couple of years. Ironically, most of them are in our listener base, I would bet. 
is people that have good paying tech jobs that have frankly probably overpaid relative to other industries for a long time. And so they've been ahead for a while. They've been making enough that they have buffer here that if eggs go from three dollars to eight dollars, they can still buy those eggs. Maybe. I mean, I just I, I would push back a little bit because we've also heard tons of people, uh, even in our you know small jobs chat room, which I would I would encourage people to use because it doesn't cost you anything, right? Whether you're the employer or the uh, you know prospective employee, uh, we and we don't get anything, do we, Chris? I don't think we get a damn thing from that. No, it's just a matrix. It's a chat community room. thing. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of people have gotten laid off, right? There's there's been. I mean, I would say yes. If you if you were making you know eighty thousand dollars a year or something, it's a lot easier to take the hit than than somebody you know like let's say a, a bartender or, or you know a waitress during COVID. But it, it's it's still like pain is all relative, and it still hurts. So I, I I agree with you. Like, there's also we've talked about this before. Like classes of tech people. Like, yeah, fancy pants guy who went to MIT and then got a job at Google and you know, is really upset because now he has to show up at the office and he can't get his massage every day. Well, I agree. I, I do believe work from home is actually a good idea for a lot of stuff. I It's hard for me to sympathize with someone who started off making that much money with that kind of perks. You know, it, it, it yeah, I don't know. Drunk money is bad. I don't even know what to say. Right? The zero interest rate drunk money was really, really bad. It created this whole situation and... And it's coming back, baby. Just give it yeah. another month. It's coming well, back. That, that's what I feel. I feel like we're we're you finally know. on. The, we're just about on the other side of this. You and I, we've been talking about this for a while because you and I started giving people a heads up. It was coming six months or so before it started happening. And told we were nuts, right? And right. now here we are on the other end of it, and we're telling you it's about to it's about to ease up. But it got rough. It got really rough, <laughs> like bad. <laughs> so well, okay, it's about to ease up, but. And that won't fix it. That won't fix it right away. That's exactly where I'm going with this. I, I'm just going to use my drunk money analogy again. It's going to ease up. So are we going – are we – and I don't mean we. I mean let's be honest, the the fancy VCs. Are we going to learn to moderate our you know trendy chase the new hotness habit? No. Or are we going to go back on another bender? Of course. It, you know what, Mike? They, they have no other route because this has been happening since 2008. So you have people now... I'd argue this has been happening since 1990. Or, or yeah. I mean, it's been yeah. happening for a long time. And actually, the, the, if, you look at, if you look at Federal Reserve policy, they got really accommodative of Wall Street in the mid-80s. They really took on this third mandate, which is... So first mandate is maintain inflation. Second mandate is maintain employment. And then they really have, they have this third mandate that they, they don't admit to, but it is keep the stock market afloat because everybody's retirement's tied up in it. Well, they have – right, exactly. You got it exactly right because we went from pensions to 401ks and Roth, IRA, or Roth yeah. and regular IRAs, right? right? And this is – you know, Mike and Chris teach why you really wanted a guaranteed benefit pension and not a 401k. But hey, unless you own the company, then you definitely want the 401k or the Roth IRA. Or I don't remember which one is the most tax advantage one because you can defer your income tax and not pay high – especially if – you know, Democrats win. Like, that's an opportune time to tax free invest in your retirement, which lowers your taxable income that year. Yeah. And you can stay below that ever critical $105,000 mark. Or what I, I don't know what it is. I know Trump changed the brackets, but there, there used to be a mark where the $1 over your bracket changes and you're in a lot of trouble. So you're going to have them start to get accommodative because of this very situation. Yeah. They, they really cannot push it any further. Inflation has not been fully solved. Well, you can't, the problem is you can't go below zero, right? That was the wall. That was yep. the corner they put themselves in. They went to zero. They, zero is 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 zero. You, you, you. Yeah, and the issue is at beyond the beyond the fact that you have just absolute shenanigans like people spending two hundred thousand dollars on monkey JPEGs when you have zero percent interest rates, but that gives the Fed no tools to adjust if the market has an emergency. So if the Fed lowers interest rates a few basis points, the market's going to respond positively, but they still have room to lower. So that way, if the economic conditions are not improving, they can lower more. But once you're at zero, you cannot lower any more. So there's no way for them to juice the market and improve things. So what they've done is they've bought themselves over the last couple of years a teensy, teensy, tiny bit of breathing room where they can manipulate the rate a little bit and juice the market and pump things when they start to suffer like it's happening right now. 
And so they're probably never going to, well, never, they're probably not going to go right to zero. They're probably, if they go down, they're going to go down kind of slowly and they'll probably hover a little bit above where they were at in the past for a while. And I would think that over time will start to improve things because money gets cheaper for corporations because when the interest rate goes down, their loans are cheaper. And so they can take out loans often where the rates are actually lower than the rate of true inflation. So for a business, that's a great deal. So they'll take the rates. When they get down, they'll take the loans. They'll start hiring. They'll start investing. They'll start building again. That trickles out into the rest of the economy. But you can imagine that takes a long time. When the rates get tight, they can react very quickly by laying off, by suspending projects, by you know canceling sponsorships and advertising, pulling back on marketing, pulling back on trips, pulling back on software deals. R&D. R&D is the first to right. go. Right. And they can yeah. do that almost immediately, right? But the spin back up to start investing again in R&D or to start investing again in sales and marketing, to start investing again in hiring, you do that at a much more slower much more cautious pace. So even though the rate will come down, it's going to come down slowly. It's not going to go right to zero. It's going to come down slowly, so the impact will be slow, and businesses will naturally be slow and hesitant to begin investing in those areas again. So that will be slow. Which, honestly, is not crazy like for us, for small businesses. That's the reasonable thing to do. I mean, I wouldn't go balls out. Yeah, it's... I mean, so can I fry some uh, alligator bacon? Please do. All right. In my local paper here, there was an article, a study, or based on a study from a local university, about, unfortunately, when we had Hurricane Betty, a lot of the sewers uh, flooded up in Sarasota and other places, which is exactly what it sounds like. Now, as part of the cleanup effort, the state of Florida and the counties, you know, whatever agencies are in charge of this, test they test the, the content of the sewer water oh, God. for various diseases. Oh, we're proud to have our brand new variant of uh, new dominant COVID that is spreading like wildfire here. Yeah, yeah, I've been hearing about that. And a lot of people are infected and don't know. Mm-hmm, right? mm-hmm. And they test the sewage, and it turns out there's a lot in there. Well, you and I have been predicting that that COVID thing wasn't a once-in-a-lifetime uh, yeah. experience. Yeah. So I'm, I'm getting very... Now, Florida, just fun fact about living in a very hot place, our seasons are... People go outside in the winter and stay inside in the summer. That's hilarious. Right. So like COVID transmission is worse in the summer. Uh So the hope, and this is like the positive spin the paper put on it, is that, well, we're coming to the cooler season. And that's great because, you know, when the North gets it and everybody else gets it, it will be good. We we already went through it. You probably had COVID. And sure enough, they've been testing people. A lot of people had COVID and didn't know, right, this new version. We have no fat in in the uh, in the economic uh, you know buffer here, right? To take another hit like that, even even if it's not two years, even if it's three months, six months, what do we have? I mean, I I can only speak for myself on this, but the all those COVID business reliefs were so crooked. The business companies got a lot, yeah, a lot of little guys, myself included, are being forced to pay back money they would not have taken had they not been solicited to take it. Right. Right. I would have simply laid people off. And I'm being compelled to pay it back with interest. (laughs) Which is bullshit because the people I kept employed all got very good jobs anyway, right? They left naturally when the, when the, you know, whatever, because they were young and they got better jobs. Uh, And I'm left, basically, I kept them on and now I'm left paying for them again. So, you know, this is this is where I, the limits of government intervention are minimal, let's say, right? And try negotiating with the IRS. It's fun. What do you say we go back in time and tell the people the good story of how we recall the growth and history of DevOps? This was Stay a while and listen. suggested by Editor Drew, and I, I love the idea because, you know, this was... Part of this journey was captured, I think, on our show. Oh, yeah. When we were doing the pod, or in the early days, we were watching this go down. So, I don't know, do you have any spite, and you have any particular spot you want to start with this? Yeah, I mean, let's start, I, I think really this came about with the rise of GitHub in a lot of ways. And, and Git, right, it doesn't have to be GitHub, but I think GitHub is probably the most known and primary uh, platform 
you know, as, as development teams started using more decentralized source control, right, instead of, does anybody remember Bizarre? Huh? Oh, yeah. No? SVN? Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> uh, and GitHub started building more tools in. At the same time, we had the rise of Rails, which I think, I know I'm going to get some crap. Some people are going to yell at me for this. I actually think the Rails evangelism for things like TTD and uh, you know deployments with automated tests running is a really big part of it. I mean, Rails really... Uh, we could do a whole show very controversial show on how I I truly believe that Rails actually influenced a lot of what we would consider modern web development, particularly during the period of the rise of DevOps, right, in the aughts. I mean, MVC, right? You you only have ASP MVC because Rails exists. Then Spring Boot, suspiciously Rails similar. (laughs) I'm just kidding. Sorry, Java guys, but that's where we are. Uh, Django, right? Wait, let's keep going. It felt like there was a sea change where the role of, let's say, senior developer and IT admin were starting to overlap quite a lot, right? So what was happening is, and the, now I, I think you'll have a different perspective, Chris, but I feel like a lot of companies were trying to trim kind of more experienced IT admins and make their admin department more like the help desk people, so they would pretty heartily embrace this idea that the developers themselves would deploy the applications. Yeah. And that coupled with the Rails inspired love of, you know, remember it's a it's a big deal, right? One of the, one of the, one of the one of the tenets of this kind of development philosophy is, or deployment philosophy rather is you're deploying all the time where before this the standard was Oh man, we're going to be deploying this week. All right, everybody, nobody can take vacation, right? It was really all hands on deck. Yeah, yeah. Where where this is, you're deploying. I mean, I know a lot of places want to deploy every couple hours. It's it's kind of crazy. In 2009, just for a little bit of history, the first DevOps Day conference was held in Belgium, and I feel like around this time, there was a power dynamic developing between developers that needed to push code to like a web production or some production system. And the system administrators that built those systems. Mm-hmm. And on the sysadmin side, you'd have frustration with developers that didn't understand how the security dynamics worked or didn't under, understand all of the requirements that we had to run the system and wouldn't go through the, the, the hoops that we didn't want to set up, but we had to set up so that way we would be compliant, etc. And on the developer side, you had like, it seemed like IT was slow to respond. We just want to push this thing out and we have to wait two days before they get a guy on it so we can move our files for us. Why can't we just move our own files? And this was a frustration brewing between two sides of the folks that needed to use the same system. And it broke towards the developer eventually because companies needed the software to be built more than they needed the sysadmins to be happy and the systems would be architected correctly. Not that developers can't architect the system correctly, but at the time you had people like their entire focus for their entire career was deploying and managing systems. And you had people, their entire focus was development. And the two didn't really share the two jobs. That's not really the case anymore. And we've also had significant tooling built out, which is really what I think made DevOps very possible, is you could start to manage systems pragmatically. It started to make sense to a developer how you could manage a system, and I think that truly enabled DevOps. Yeah, so you know, it eventually became that your Docker Doku stuff could be deployed with just a config and a YAML file. Yeah, you're right. And that made it way more approachable for people to deploy software. And then there was a lot of grousing. Well, they don't actually know how the system works. Uh, but I think we're kind of past all that now. And people... We are not. No, you don't think so. You still think there's... <laughs> well, okay, we're not fully past it. But there are people that can be both excellent developers and excellent system administrators. I, f- I felt very strongly against that back in the day. So a thing that often happens in more complicated applications, though, is you do end up relying on some binary software that just needs to be on the the production system. Oh, yeah. And that's, I'm not going to say it's not possible, but it's not necessarily what these, you know, YAML file using tools, i.e. Doku, for example, which is still my favorite, are trying to do. So, I mean, uh, I got to give one to the crab people today. And the Go people, actually. I don't know why I'm promoting seaweed FS so much. I just love it. Uh, I don't get a kickback or anything. I'm just really excited about it. It's a flat file storage solution. 
uh, mimics the S3 API. I've been talking about it for three weeks now. You should go check it out. It's written yeah. in Go. Oh, our our current language of the week. So That's the you mean the ofi- you, Mike? Do you mean the official programming language of the Coder Radio program? Is that what you mean? Let's go. Yes, yes, that's what I mean. So yeah, I mean you might have to install Go dependencies, right, or whatever, depending on how you do things. You know what else I remember about DevOps? One more thing before we completely move off of it. This truly was the birth of intense business jargon and project jargon oh. coming into system administration. Wait, b- before you before you jump there, yeah. I would one more positive thing. Okay, and then I'm going to join you in dunking like Michael Jordan here. All right, Docker was huge for DevOps, and yeah. Docker and the whole ecosystem of uh, container orchestration tools that spawned, such as Kubernetes, huge. And we called it, and I'm never going to stop reminding people of that. All right, go on. Take take your dump. I just think that it's kind of a shame. And I I'll, a lot of times when I hear a group of people talking the abstract, abstract, I think it often indicates they don't understand the fundamentals. And you had that kind of happen, is these intense, vague names and descriptions of things started to get used more. And it's not that jargon wasn't technical beforehand. It was technical, but it was specific. And it was purposeful. And I th- we saw kind of like this mal change. I don't know, like this. It was a I don't. I think it was a bad change because we went from experts that are proficient in their field speaking to other experts to everybody kind of talking in these abstracts, which was necessary, I think, but unfortunate and almost almost so bad you could parody it. And so that was one of the things that I just really got turned off when I was in the industry back then. And just really turned me off was that kind of shift. And I I know it's a weird complaint now, but it was a thing. So isn't this just exactly what happened with like agile, right? Yes. Well, I think that's, it's this in there is this waterfall to agile kind of transition as well. Yeah. But, you know, agile, the original agile manifesto has some very, very strong points. And then the consultants got involved. Yes. Uh, I would even, and I know this, I get, we get, we've gotten over the years some, but negative feedback on this, but that's okay. Everybody's opinion is welcome, even Egon's. Uh, although Egon doesn't actually care about this. The testing stuff, right? Testing became the same thing where it went from, hey, we can automate some testing that will catch regressions. Great. You have to test 100% of your code, and it becomes like a religion. And there's like TDD and BDD and, you know, Gandalf the Grey DD consultants that you can hire. Oh, yeah, they love it. So much money to be made. To help you manage right. this? Anybody who's a consultant, I mean, unless they're a dev calling themselves or an admin calling themselves a consultant, if their whole job is PowerPoints, just, you know, maybe just take your team out to dinner. Mike, to be fair, there's there's a good portion of Outlook in there, too. You know? So they do Outlook and, and PowerPoints. Fuck Outlook. Right, right. So. <laughs> SharePoint gives me headaches. Not I even do a kidding. Lot of share, I, I do I've, a lot of custom integrations for SharePoint with Alice now, and I just do not like it. I must have said this on the show before. But I literally had a coworker that I sat next to. And, you know, these were like short wall cubicles. And he, he spent all day in Outlook. He did not, I don't even know if he had any other applications installed on his computer. And as a tech guy, I'm always paying attention to this. So he never, he would just sit there in Outlook all day long, going between his calendar and his inbox. And then he would get up and go to meetings and he'd bring a, a paper pad. And then he'd come back and he'd spend the rest of the day in Outlook. I don't even know what he was doing. But he just never ran any other applications on his computer. Are you sure he wasn't like tabbing out to mini clip or something like that? <laughs> Maybe when I'm not looking. Maybe he was aware. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So DevOps, it's uh, where are we now? I think we should wrap it up there. Where are we now at DevOps? How do you feel? You're you're the system admin. I don't guy. feel like anybody talks about it anymore. Oh, contrary. You know, because even well, even if you're well, but here's what I mean. It's like even if you're a system administrator, you're kind of doing things the DevOps way now. They won. S- so I feel like the people who talk about it now, even the evil consultants got kind of shellacked yeah. by the, the, we used to call them platform as a service. Remember that? Paz, which always reminds me of Paz, the Easter die, right? The Easter egg die thing. Uh, but it's like DO, our beloved former sponsor, who I use all the time, wants to get, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm losing my voice, wants to get you to use their application framework right they're uh yeah, yeah. they have a they have a name for it but it's basically selling you devops 
that is specific to them. Right. Yes. <laughs> Amazon is more than eager to, to do the same thing. Well, this is where I was going to go. It's you're, Now it's cloud. It's cloud now. It's yeah. cloud. Well, I would even argue Lambda and Microsoft, what is it, Azure Functions, yep. all that stateless, serverless, whatever crap, that's just DevOps taken to its logical conclusion. Don't even worry about a server. Just give us your function. We'll throw it up there and we'll charge you three times as much to run it every time. Well, what we have now is we have people that are AWS shops, Azure shops, Google Cloud shops, and that's a vertical. It's not... Like before, it was the entire industry, but now you specialize in that vertical. It's a different thing. And it's, and you want to talk about jargon heavy. I, I have a confession to make, though. Oh, okay. So my choice is always like DO, right? Yeah. Like if, if, if it's just like a client who comes to me and says, we don't care, get it done. You know, tell us what to do. I actually, if I'm not given the choice... I prefer Azure to, to AWS, which feels like blasphemy, <laughs> but I just do. I I find it more, I mean, it's very Microsoft, but I, I think the correlation, maybe maybe it's a correlation issue of a lot of these companies I'm working with are are very deeply into the SharePoint Active Directory world. So just being on Azure tends to one it's easier to sell to their it people right they don't it's not a scary new vendor and two there are certain advantages you could get with permissions and stuff like that yeah makes sense coder.show slash boost yeah you can boost from the web now and here's why we like the boost there is no middleman i think you'll probably recall we were just recently talking about patreon and how they're changing the whole deal on their creators. I mean, they're claiming Apple's making them do it. But then why make everyone change even outside the app? Like these kinds of things you don't want to build a foundation on top of. And we want to do this for another 15, 20, 30 years as long as the old voice box holds out. We don't want a middleman. The other thing that is a real reality the last couple of years is sats are a scarce asset. There's only 21 million Bitcoin total. So what you're doing is when you're boosting, you're boosting sats. You're helping the network hedge against currency debasement. Inflation hits small businesses excruciatingly hard. And for the media business, the ad rates or just have been going down in some cases or just completely gone, combined with the cost of business going up because of inflation. So with sats, we can be strategic in our timing. We can hold on to them if we want or if we need to cash them out now, we can, but the big thing is we don't have to worry about inflation melting away a strategic reserve that we can pull from as the network has expenses. And then a big one for us, it's all an open standard and it's all open source from the monetary unit on the network to the self-hosted infrastructure to receive the boost and everything in between that glues it all together. It's all open source. It's all self-hosted. It's programmable money and the workflow is only getting easier for you and the podcaster. You grab the strike app, Try out something like Fountain, link them up, and you're set. Or you can boost from the web, too. You don't even need the Fountain app anymore. And if you send a boost of 2,000 sats or more, we'll read your message on the show. It's a powerful system, but maybe it's not for you. Maybe you want to put your membership on autopilot. Well, we got a version for you. You go to coder.show slash membership, and you'll also get an ad-free version of the show, i.e. you won't have to hear this anymore. If you use the promo code SUMMER as well, you can take $1 a month off forever! The Coder program is an acquired taste, and we appreciate your support. Either a membership or a boost, it means a lot to us, and it keeps us going. That's coder.show slash boost to boost from the web, or coder.show slash membership to put your support on autopilot. So we have a report from Mark Gurman over at Bloomberg, and wow. he says that Apple is developing a tabletop robot. Here, I'll play a little bit of his interview so we can hear it in his Lord. own words. They've landed on this home device. They're all in on robotics right now. Robotics is the next big thing at Apple. They're talking about humanoids. They're talking about mobile robots to go around your home. Now they're talking about this home device. It's a robotic neck connected to an iPad. It can swivel 360 degrees, bend, move up and down, move around on top of a table or a desk. 
video conferencing. Okay. But it's essentially your first Apple intelligence device. It's a AI-ified iPad, a fully voice-controlled system uh, that can move around on your table. It's going to be pretty niche, but it's also going to be pretty cool, like, it, like the Vision Pro. It sounds- so, you know, maybe $1,000 for a table robot. Do you remember the uh, butter bot in Rick and Morty? Yes. What is my purpose? <laughs> you, you you serve butter. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. So, well done, Uncle Tim, on the existential crisis product. It really, I mean, full-on humanoid robots at some point, too. Um, yeah. And the other thing that's sort of interesting in here is this is a subsidiary of Foxconn that's taking on the manufacturing of this. And this subsidiary has built robots, one robot, a manufacturing robot for Foxconn. Um, the code name they say for this Apple robot project is J595, if anybody wants to look it up. It's just right off the top. What people are picturing is, you remember the iMac that had the mm-hmm. flat screen on an arm? They're kind of picturing something like that, I think. Oh, God. They expect the launch to be 2026, 2026. Jeez. Well, maybe people have money again by then to spend on stuff like this. Yes, to, to serve butter. Uh, Apple has lost it. They've lost, they've lost their way. You know, and I, I go back to, I've said this comment before. I think the problem is, is that the folks that run Apple, it's kind of like an oligarchy over there. And there's a few key people, some of whom have been around since the jobs days, uh, that make all the decisions. And, you know, you can see them on their website. You see them in the WWDC events. They make the big decisions. And the problem is, is they have been privileged and rich for 30 years. And they don't work for a living like we work for a living. They work, but not what the common people do. And they don't know what problems people are trying to solve in the real world. And so all they can try to do is come up with the next big Apple product in, like, their echo chamber. And so what you get is... A thousand dollar tabletop iPad that follows you around like a creep. You know it's going to run its ass right off the table. I mean, oh, come yeah. on, it, yeah, oh, it, and it's thousand dollars broken. The arm's gone. You know, I don't. Uh, this is a, you know, your your buddy Marco Arman on the ATP show was actually pretty pretty negative on Apple, uh, up to the point of saying they might need new leadership. Really? Yeah, it's 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 they've gotten I I. They've gotten so big that making that number go up and to the right, I think, is just a big challenge for them. I look at what a flop so far the Vision Pro has been. Vision Pro is going nowhere. I guess they're selling for like half price on eBay right now. You know, when they come down to like 30% of the price, I might get one. Yeah, I was like, oh, maybe yeah. we're getting there. Yeah. I mean, the Meta Quest is fun, but it's yeah. it's it's a toy yeah. and a really expensive toy, like 500 bucks. So. But there you can share more easily with people. Yeah. yeah. So there's that. So. Also, so get this. Tesla is hiring humans to train the Optimus robot via motion capture like you do for a movie. And so Tesla is hiring very specific people. They need somebody between 5'7 and 5'11 uh, because Optimus is likely to have a height of 5'8. And they've hired over 50 people in the last year that fit this description that are using mocap suits to do different tasks and they do these different tasks in these simulated real world environments like doing the dishes I don't know probably not that but they they do the task in these mocap suits and then they use it to train the robot how to do the, the same task that's what Tesla's doing right now full on humanoid robots we went from LLMs to robots real quick Mike well we, we need our next uh, you know thing isn't that something I mean, that is, yeah. it's, I, I thought, you know, maybe it'd be quantum computing, but no, it, it's LLMs because these robots have to be able to understand us, right? So it just the LLM is going to empower it. So it's like it, the two play into each other. If I were going to buy a robot for the house, I'd probably be more willing to buy an Apple robot, though, than a Tesla robot or a Microsoft robot or a GM robot. <laughs> you know? Yeah, there's this new upstart company over here in uh, Orlando called Skynet. They've yeah. got this. They've got this. What's Palmer Lucky's company's name? I wonder if they're going to make a domestic robot. <laughs> How about Palantir's robot? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I just wild. So that's their next moonshot. So they're they've killed the car, and they're going for robots. And I just got to ask you out there, audience, would you do it? No, a robot powered by Siri? Are you crazy? 
Well, come on now. Let's so it's 2026. So let's say we're on generation two of Apple intelligence. Let's say it's actually good at figuring a few things out. You know, there's stuff around the house that sucks. You know, there's stuff around the the office here that needs done. Um, I don't know what this robot would be capable of, but if it could solve actual problems, I'd be interested. I doubt it, though, because we never even got there with the virtual lady tube assistants. Like we never got to the point where my lady tube could contact Mike's lady tube and automatically arrange a meeting on our two calendars. Like they couldn't even handle basic stuff like reservations, restaurants or just two people with lady tubes making a meeting like an actual assistant would do. We never got there. So there, I, I'm just very skeptical. But, it, you know, if it was functional, somebody could mow the lawn or I don't know what it would do. Dishes? Cook? I don't know what you have a robot do in your house. But repairs? What if it could do repairs? I think the dream would be Rosie the Robot from the Jetsons, right? Yeah, buddy. I mean, I had that dream, but it's... <laughs> 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 yeah, good show. Oh, all right. All right, well... Why don't we, uh, we got a few emails. You want to get into some of these emails? Yeah, here? let's burn through them. Inappropriate? R. Allen lives in a uh, moose-based place, he says, I guess. Oh, no, that was supposed to be the most based place. All right, that makes a lot more sense. So I was kvetching about the traffic cameras in my area that automatically capture my license yep. plate. And R. Allen writes, traffic cameras are not used in Missouri. What happened is, is people started putting fake paper tags on their cars and paper masks of city officials on. So like a, a paper mask on your face of the city official. Then they would start running the red lights at 2 a.m., which automatically sent the tickets to the people in charge. That's so badass. Uh, we would never do anything like that here. He goes on to say, uh, they want to weaponize traffic cameras? Then we'll just point it right back at them. Selling the telemetry from your car and using it to de- deny you a way to work? You just don't buy from them. Or buy an older model. He says, I'm old and cranky, and I'm not afraid to mess up some jerks on my way out the door. <laughs> Thank you, R. Allen. We need more people like you out there messing up the jerks. I've clearly lived in the Pacific Northwest for too long. It never even occurred to me, I guess probably because it's probably violating the law, but paper tags and masks to look like the officials' cars and drivers and then to intentionally run the lights. That's so rebel. I can't believe I never heard that before. I love it. That's better than a Guy Fox mask. That is. That is. Thank you, Arlen. Mike the Forgotten writes in about CrowdStrike. He says, I was just listening to the conversation about CrowdStrike, and I share your frustration, but from the angle of software engineering. So many tech companies call their developers, quote, engineers, but it's events like this that demonstrate why, quote, real professional engineers, those who took the standardized tests, look down on people that call themselves engineers. This problem was preventable. But instead of engineering a solution, they built the equivalent of someone doing a DIY for the first time. We, the software industry, have to do better. We don't have any official regulation or certifications that we need to pass like other industries do. But when one of your devs has a bad day and it costs the whole world $5.4 billion in losses, you can sure bet that we have the same or even higher impact. You could argue that no lives were lost, so we don't need the same scrutiny as someone building a bridge. But I would counter that No lives were lost this time. It's just a matter of time, though. What if one of those delays was a cancer patient and days, months, or years were cut off of their life because they missed a treatment window? The only way we can prevent regulation is by actually engineering solutions and self-governing ourselves. I mean, yeah, I'm all for preventing regulations. Uh... This is why I I had some big energy towards Microsoft. I mean, I realized they didn't distribute the faulty code. Yeah, it wasn't them, right? But it was their fragile operating system and its crappy boot process that hasn't been better engineered, right? Like Microsoft should be building their operating system to withstand flawed software because we have 35, 40 years now of data to show us that people are going to ship software on your operating system that does bad things. And so we should build that way. And the way we do that is by making the boot process more robust so it knows how many times it's failed. And if it's multiple times, it boots into a backup image. They have backup images. They're called shadow copies. So make them freaking bootable. And that's all you got to do to to have solved for this is you just have it come up into recovery mode where it disables the boot drivers because it failed twice. And it would have solved for this. So I put the blame on Microsoft because they didn't engineer the foundation that CrowdStrike built upon. Now, CrowdStrike screwed up. They shouldn't have done that. 
And it's super embarrassing, and I think they've been let off way too easy to the point where it's oh, bizarre. Oh, I don't think they've been let off. I see, oh, you don't th- think so? I think I think this is one of those things where we're used to moving fast in our little corner of the world, but okay. the rest of the world moves super slow. Litigious stuff moves slower. I agree with yeah. you there. My, Mike, who wrote in, is right. The five point whatever billion dollars, that's going to send several lawyers' grandkids to college when the lawsuits all come in. Crowds, <laughs> I agree with you on that. If I was CrowdStrike, I'd be looking at like insurance against lawsuits and bankruptcy protection or what you know contingency plans because there's no. They sent out Mike. They sent out Uber cards. You're good. They're good. That didn't work. Ten dollar Uber cards, which is insulting <laughs> enough, but also ended up not working. So I, I mean, if I'm you know the president of Delta Airlines and I need to not have my uh, huevos rancheros cut off at the next board meeting, uh, I'm going to my chief legal counsel. Like, so I want to bend these guys over a barrel. How do I do that? I just realized Microsoft has zero incentive to improve this. They already have the dominance. They can't. And they would love a nice moat. They'd love one more moat. Give them another moat. Why not? So Microsoft's defense, just I'm going to make their case. I'm not saying if I agree. Because I could see a lot of people are saying it's disingenuous. Is The problem is they were forced to allow this. right? If Microsoft had their way, no one would have this kind of access. Yeah. And would the EU force them? Which, i got to be honest, if I'm Satya, that's exactly what I would say. Because I want to get the EU out of my, my knickers, right? Yeah. I want them... I want them out of my lingerie it's a drawer. Great, it's a great moment to take a little sniper. Then, well, it wouldn't have happened if we hadn't been forced to build our system by regulation. Right. What you're, su- what you're suggesting right, is making it easier and less dangerous for the thing they don't want to be done to be done. Why would you ever do that? It would be like me saying – never mind. I'm not even going to suggest <laughs> it because I don't want to give anybody ideas. I don't like lawyers. I think lawyers are some pretty s- slippery folks. Unless they're listening to our show. You should let us know. Maybe or my we, lawyer. Maybe we should hire you. So if, you, if you're a lawyer and you listen to the show, email in. <laughs> Somebody is going to sue us for libel one. Day. Yeah, we, we should build on some contacts. Yeah. I can't imagine Microsoft couldn't come up with some plausible case that CrowdStrike has caused them damages. Because I, I think the answer is you sue them into oblivion, right? Like, like basically you go Peter Thiel, Hulk Hogan. This isn't a suit to recover money. This is a suit to... And this entity. That would be fascinating because CrowdStrike is a very politically connected entity. And if I was Microsoft, and where's I, I need my the love of my life, Valerie, in a minute, I'd go right back to the EU and say, look what you've wrought. Ah, uh, look what you've done. F*** the EU. Yeah. I mean, seriously, f*** them. Like, it, what do they got? Nothing. They have their regulations, but they're... They're on a track down the toilet. They're actually they're very proud. They're like they're going to be the global regulator of tech, don't you know? They're going to. Yeah. What if you just don't let them? (laughs) Like, they're. I'm sorry, but like China, America, even Russia, to a point, you have to like listen to. But I don't know. I basically they want to be the local auditor, like the local. It's just such a scummy thing. They're, they're, I'll, I'll give you a, well, not in the EU anymore, but Chaucer, you guys are like the partners. You're just going around trying to tax the shit out of everybody and say, oh, you can't do that. You can't do that. But like build something of your own. Where's your Microsoft? Where's, yeah, where's your big tech company at? Right. And I agree we do need some regulation, but it should be done by us. And that regulation should be in the form of breakups. Oh, so. YouTube should be its own company. The browsers YouTube, should all be their own company. Xbox, instead of Microsoft just yep. destroying it like they are, they should just spin it out. Mm-hmm. A- if Azure was its own company, yeah. whoo, Office its own company, Office and Outlook together. Mm-hmm. You could make SQL. You could make SQL its own business too, actually. Right. Or all Microsoft's consulting services that they do should would be like one of the biggest consulting companies. And then world. obviously Windows. Yeah, I mean, I actually think Windows would probably be one of the weaker ones. Yeah, but, you'd, just stick, yeah. you'd just stick it with something else at this point. <laughs> I think you stick Windows with the uh, Office, probably. Office, you, you yeah. stick it with the Office guys. Cause, yeah, <laughs> Apple's oh the harder God. one to break up. I mean, Vision Pro should be its own company, just so they can write that <laughs> off and be done with it. No like, kidding. Take the loss, take the tax break. <laughs> but no, I mean, no offense to our EU listeners, but this is kind of I'm hyper sympathetic to the Microsoft case here. Of you made us open up our kernel. What did you think was going to happen? Which, if you knew what you were talking about, you would know is a crazy thing to do. 
Yeah, I wonder if this will be a talking point Microsoft uses in the future, the next time regulators come. Oh, uh, Satya's too nice because he, he doesn't want to draw a negative because they're doing a bunch of other crap that they probably should be regulated Well, for. I guess who's one of their biggest customers? The governments. Right. So. <laughs> but, yeah. it, 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 yeah. it's, but if you if you really look at it, like it's – I don't agree with everything that was written in the op-ed, but was it uh, – who was it? Was it Paul Graham or Peter Thiel? One of them wrote a uh, op-ed. I think it was in the Wall Street Journal. Someone will fact-check me on this and where it was. But they made a pretty strong case, and they were all over Twitter with it, about why the EU doesn't have a Microsoft or an Apple. Yes, and I remember this. I do remember this. I remember this piece. I don't remember who it was. Yes, though. a couple weeks ago. It, I, now, the case was awfully self-serving because they kept mentioning crypto. <laughs> but, you know, it, it, it does make me wonder because, like, how come Canonical never pulled it off? Right? Canonical's a big company, but they never made it. Uh, my beloved Sousa just seems troubled these days. You know, it, it, what happened? Business? We'll see. I'd be curious to know what their response is. Now, as it happens, just as a matter of production schedule, we are recording ahead this week, which means that someone may, may have boosted in a new official language, but we don't know. And by default, that makes Go the official language one more week. And as promised, since Devator is listening live, we have our Go track. This was created by Mr. Wes Payne, and it is inspired in the classic style of Avril Lavigne, and it is the official language of the Coda Radio program for Go. Yeah. All right. All right. That's not bad. It kind of sounds like Sirius XM radio, but it's not that bad. It's not bad. bad. I'm yeah. We'll take it. <laughs> Thank you, everybody who does support the show, our Coder QAQ. Thank you very much. Coder.show slash membership. If you'd like to put your support on autopilot. And thank you, everybody who does boost in with one of those new podcast apps at podcastapps.com. We'll be getting to your messages. We're back to our regularly scheduled program. I think I'll have just gotten back from uh, Toronto when we talk. Yeah. Anywhere you want to send the people in the meantime. Go to alice.dev and, you know, be nice to your local European politician. Yeah. they they Maybe they mean well. I don't know them. It's possible they mean well, Mike. You know, maybe they're just stupid. No, I don't think they're stupid. They mean well, but they're, they're dumb. They're... So you think they're evil then? Because <laughs> if they're smart, <laughs> then that's not good because that's <laughs> that means they're evil. <laughs> I'll know. let more qualified people All right. yeah, maybe speak listeners on this know. one. Yeah. I'd love to know. Love to hear your thoughts. Coder.show slash contact, or if it's really mean, boost it in. Links to what we talked about today. If it's really Coder. mean, boost it in. <laughs> you have to pay us. The well, more trolly it is, me. the more you have to pay. <laughs> you're going to yell at me after all. Uh, really, you, actually, this week. Uh, Coder.show slash 585 for links to what we talked about today. At least some of it. And, of course, over there you'll find information about our Matrix chat room going 24-7, our RSS feed. And we should be live next Tuesday at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. But you can always get the deets at jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar. Thanks so much for joining us on this week's episode of the Coda Radio Program. See you right back here next week.